<laughs> okay, so now, thank you. I think we're all in the right room. We know we're all doing social justice. And I'll show you, maybe I'll also talk about the process of writing dissertation. Basically, these are some chapters. You can be creative in writing your, your uh, uh, titles. You can download this on SlideShare or on academia.edu. I recommend all of you open free accounts, academia.edu. I was able to get co-authors from Belgium, from Canada, without knowing them, because they say we have the shared same interests. Why don't we write together? And it worked. Here are people from Nepal saying, you're doing social justice. You're doing peace in our conflict situation. Can we collaborate? Or I'm editing a book. Do you want to submit a chapter? So join academia.edu or SlideShare, I think it's .net. These are all posted there, you can download these. Okay, so usually a dissertation has these elements, but you can be creative. Dissertation writing is technical, but it does not mean you cannot be creative. You can merge the technical with the creative. You can say, uh, instead of introduction, perhaps you can say, this is how it all began. Right? Consider of literature review can say lay of the land. For example, uh, most people would say research design or research methodology. Since I'm not doing a quantitative paper, I said that's too pompous. So I said research process. Other people would say this is how I do it. Okay? You can be creative. I didn't dare use the word results because it's not quantitative. It sounds wrong like apples instead of oranges. So I wrote findings. And conclusion, others would say interpretation or discussion. To me, it's like, it's clear if I say conclusion. Others would say summary, conclusion, and recommendation. Okay, so these are some elements. Other people have an added chapter called background or historical overview. But how I do it was, it's not separate. The background was not based on literature, but based on the people with whom I had discussion. So it's not separate, but part of the findings, okay? Now, uh, I, I have pictures of people uh, who are some of the people uh, with whom I had a dialogue for my dissertation. And these were people involved in my writing. Uh, but first, when I attended, I think one of the first conferences was the African American Latino Latina Adult Education Research Conference, where Dr. G was the editor. She butchered my paper in a positive way. Let me tell you, when people butcher your paper, it's not that they hate you or they want to make your life miserable. They're guiding you how to write. I was on my computer oh, back and forth. It's like, does Dr. G sleep? Like 12, 1, 2, 3. Oh, after that, I felt this is it. This is how I should write. So when you are given critique by your committee members or reviewers, don't feel bad. They're not there to kill you. They're there to help you constructively. So I said, you mean you don't have a theory? No, she said nicely. <laughs> so what is your theory? So postmodernism, but which kind of postmodernism? Is it Derrida? Is it Foucault? Is it, be clear, are you talking of power? Are you talking of narratives? Are you talking of discourses? So which ones? So that made my life. I said, now I am proud. I can write and proceed conferencing. Okay? So that was my first brush with Dr. D. I never took a class with her, but I learned from her through conference paper writing. Okay. And then I had Dr. Wei. She was in my committee. Uh, when I attended AHRD conferences, she would grab me and sit uh, to have lunch. She told me, hey, why don't we have lunch together? Let me tell you something. You want to finish your dissertation, swallow your pride. Your committee is there to help you. Uh, listen to the advice. If you have questions, ask them. When she said that to me, it was so clear that, oh, yes, of course. That's, that goes without saying they're there to help you. So I said, yeah, they're giving me good advice. And Dr. Uh, Laurel Jerris was also in my committee, but she left because, you know, she retired. So I had two uh, members of the committee who left. And I'm so lucky to have left with three uh, committee members. Lucky, I'll tell you why. Dr. J. Jorge gave me the big macro picture, right? These are the pieces that fit together. And this piece kind of is off. No, you need alignment. 
And this piece you need to put some more. This one maybe you lack rigor. So he showed the whole picture and when he took me on, uh, first I wanted to take the course in, in the fall, and uh, not take the course, sorry, to finish my dissertation or start working with him intensely. He said, no, I already have three. And I was so hurt, like he doesn't want me. No. But he meant that he said, by December 11, when classes are over, I'll help you. And he really meant it, day or night. And I texted him. So I wrote and he said, Ray, uh, this is the comment, and he does track changes. So you can see it on the computer what are things that need to be changed. So I made changes, and the, can I see in two days? He said, yes. But I have a class till nine. I said, can I see you at nine? Yes. Where? But I'm in parking lot. All arrangements, you make it possible. So it's not like in the movies, you have some you know, dealings in the parking lot. No, this is <laughs> dissertation. This is dissertation. So he helped me day and night, weekend, just name it. Uh, and then, you know, I was just editing, editing. Dr. Rick Oren, now he does ESL, right? Literacy. He was good in micromanaging. I have Dr. Hoy, the macro picture. He said, he would cross the T's and dot my eyes, like right here and there, like, oh wow. I have the macro and the micro. And Dr. Lemuel, the Dean of uh, Education before he moved on to another school, I was so lucky. My conclusion is that, Okay, Ray, you said everything. So what? Who cares about your dissertation? Okay, now that you're done with the dissertation, now what? So good. I had the best combo of the world of dissertation writing. So it's not me. It's a teamwork with me and my committee members. Okay, so what's my problem statement? I'm saying that, you know, there are many uh, literature written about peace, conflict resolution, uh, and uh, peace building, but most of them are seen from the classroom. I, I went through the literature. Two places you want to look at, for example, the Eric search on the computer or JSTOR. Eric will be all of the academic journals for education. JSTOR for social sciences, J-S-T-O-R. Type your keywords. Uh, think now your, what your keywords are. For example, for me, it's conflict. Uh, then sometimes advanced, you have conflict transformation, advanced conflict resolution, and then advanced more conflict management. And then you can limit it to say, because you are required to, aside from seminal work, you know, like things which might have been written 2,000 years ago or 500 years ago, but are still important, the seminal work, you're expected to read the latest literature. So you can limit it to from, uh, let's say, 2009 to 2014, bang. And then everything will come up. Maybe there'll be 20,852, too many. So you will limit it further, focusing on, let's say, not classroom. Then you type again, zero, like, whoops, that's too much. I don't need a zero. But you can prove in the academic literature there's none by doing the JSTOR search or the ERIC search. And then you remove the non-classroom, uh, non type another word, like for example, war-torn countries. And then say, oh, okay, 582, wonderful, if that's what you want. Then when you write your survey of literature, you're looking at the big picture. You can say, doing Eric search, I use these key terms, limiting from 2009 to 2014, there were 582 entries on this topic in war-torn countries and 27,000 for not, for all literature. Another thing you can do, one, read the abstract only. Make it uh, clear if you want and read it in the dissertation. I only read the abstract and these, this will be the summary of what I have read. Or I read the whole article. Whichever you do, make it clear in your dissertation. So you have all of these things that you can see and find out when you uh, do your search. So I did search. Most of the writings are about classroom. A few uh, were about war-torn era, Israel, and then of course Palestine, separately. And then you have South Africa, and then sprinkling of Cambodia, you know, Somalia. But mostly none, very few. So I said, there's a gap. 
And I'm lucky to have Dr. Jorge because he would say, well, what about the United Nations? So, the, no, the search engine would not give me UN. UN has a rich database online available for free. UNDP Development Program, UN Environment Program, U, UNIFEM Women's Program, all the UN programs, uh, United Nations Children's uh, Fund. So go over there, UNESCO, of course, if you're doing adult and higher ed. And I found there's some literature in adult, uh, on adult and higher ed in UNESCO talking about <coughs> peace and so on. But my focus is not teachers. My focus are people at the grassroots level. Okay, so I said very few uh, going through these searches uh, would find them. If you want to write your dissertation, also read other people's dissertations because there's certain structure that, you know, that people want to see when you write the dissertation. So that would help you write your dissertation too. And uh, what else? Uh, read the abstract, read the table of contents or the outline, go to the index. Now, uh, so the purpose of this study is to look at what the popular uh, educators are. So what is popular education? Right, we are in who's focusing on higher ed, like student affairs, faculty affairs, academic affairs. Who's focusing on Adult education, informal training, community education, okay, yeah, and then so oh, women's you know education and so on. So do two fields. Popular educators will be people who are outside the, the formal classroom, who could be learning, uh, but in social context, like in social movements, in the community, and building skills. You can even you know like for example in a Philippine village. I'm from the Philippines, where people gather around uh, under a mango tree and talk about, look, uh, men are beating their wives, so what do we do? Uh, men can also join the meeting, like, yeah, that's too much. They're drunk and they beat their wives. Like, who's at fault? The woman, because the man is drunk? No, let's all gather together, what do we do? Well, maybe if something happens, oh, I should change this to Bangladesh. I actually went to a village in Bangladesh with a group of GSS saying, well, if a man would beat the wife and say, talak, 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 talak means divorce. In the Muslim world, if you talak three times, you're gone as a wife. Okay, so if the man is drunk and he beats the wife and he says talak, the whole village will go to the house and tell the man, shut up, take back what you said. It's your fault, it's not the woman's fault. And it worked. In the village. That's popular education. They didn't learn that in the classroom. They learned it out you know, under the banyan tree. That's one way of doing popular education. It's extreme, but you see the idea. Okay, so I originally started with eight or nine research questions. I was so ambitious. My committee members say, Ray, chill, cool down. That's too much. You can group them together. I said, no, I need all of these. And I remember Dr. Wei uh, asking me for a power lunch at the HRD conference. Maybe this was Indiana or I forgot where. Uh, thanks to Dr. Jean Roth, I went to the HRD conferences. And so uh, she said, why don't you lump them together? So I said, oh yeah, it's possible. One, it will be the context, the first one. The second is, what should you do? Educational strategies. And three, what should they learn? Remember, whatever you write, follow your passion. You may want to write about women, you may want about LGBT, you may want to write about African Americans, you may want to learn about diversity, whatever, environmentalism, follow your passion. But then don't forget, your degree is in adult or higher ed. So what is the ed here in your paper? It should show up, there's ed thing there. So there's ed thing here, number two and three are the ed things. Or else they say, you're in the wrong department. We cannot give you a degree. Okay. So uh, there are three ways by which you can look at the world. Okay. The first one is functionalism. Everything works. You can reach an equilibrium. Everything is right. Or second, no, you can, there's no equilibrium. There's conflict. Okay. That's what I take. I say, I don't assume everything is fine. And that if there's a problem, things will work out. That's not what I was saying. I was saying, no, there is inequality, and it's okay. People will work it out, and new things will come out of it. And the third approach would be symbolic interactionism. You look at the micro-individual actions. I'm not. Although I look at individuals, I look at them in the social and organizational context. 
So the framework I used was functionalism. Okay. I'm sorry, not functionalism, but conflict perspective. Okay, I've given you definition of uh, pop ed uh, from Freire. It's non-formal learning. You can learn about social justice, peace, human rights, gender, environment, development. And then power is important because for many things, if you're dealing with social justice, you have to know where is power situated. For example, if you are an administrator, by the fact that you're an administrator, you should admit you are in a power relations and you are in the upper hand. If you are a teacher, like it or not, you have power over the students. The, the issue is how to make the relationship more equitable and to recognize your power and not to abuse your power. Okay. And that was from Foucault. And then this is from uh, Dr. Phyllis Cunningham, one of our faculty uh, who passed away. There are three types of social change. It does not always mean positive or one direction. It could be consensus. Oh, we'll agree with Obama. We'll agree with George W. Or pluralism. We, we are different and we accept our differences. Or three, well, structuralism, we see some basic problem. We thought Jim Crow is dead, but we have a new Jim Crow. It's worse. So maybe we have to raise consciousness and bring about change. Okay, if you've not read New Jim Crow, you have to read that Michelle Alexander's book. That racism is not dead in the US. And she has, she's a lawyer, professor. She has a lot of facts and legal cases to show you. Michelle Alexander, The New Jim Crow. It's in the bestseller list.